uh, have your Bibles, I had you turn to Proverbs chapter 30, and we have one verse of Scripture as our text, of course. And verse 10 says these words, Accuse not a servant unto his master, lest he curse thee, and thou be found guilty. In James chapter 3, I'm going to read a portion of Scripture from this passage of Scripture. You don't have it in your, your uh, notes as such. But uh, let me just fill in some of the blanks here before I get into the reading of James 3. It says, this verse is not speaking of known sin or wrongdoing. Uh, this is speaking of accusing one without all the facts or conclusive proof. Of course, James really brings everything in a succinct form uh, here in regards to the tongue. And you notice as we go through Proverbs, it seems like there's a lot of verses that deal with the subject of the tongue. My brethren, so you know already from our recent study of the book of James that this is really a book talking about how believers are to live the, the Christian life. And it's interesting that practically a whole chapter here of five chapters is addressing the use of our tongues. So he begins this uh, chapter by addressing believers. He says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. You know, this is very, very important, especially for we preachers and teachers of the Word of God. And of course, I believe that that's one of the main interpretations here from verse 1. I remember years ago, I came up uh, from, uh, from the States, of course, and I was uh, teaching on a particular topic, and I could even defend it. I thought scripturally, but there was a series of events that took place here in the church that really got me thinking about things. And, and I told my wife, I said, something's not right here. And I said, I know we've been taught something all along. And I said, I, I'm going to have to set this aside. And I'm going to have to uh, really just get the Bible out. And so I started from Genesis and I started working my way through. And I had a couple of uh, shelves in my library. I still have to this day where there are uh, two shelves lined with books that dealt with this one particular topic. And I remember that I even count, uh, counseled a couple in regards to this particular matter. And the reason I'm not saying the matter is I don't want everybody's mind to go get sidetracked here with that. And so what I did is I remember I encouraged them they, and I thought I had done my homework and we went ahead and, and uh, participated in that. And then as I studied my Bible, I realized, you know what, I was wrong in that. And I can remember going to their house and sitting there in their living room and opening up the scriptures once again and just sharing with them what God had showed me through his word and through teaching. And, uh, and so they cried, I cried, and I told them this. I said, you know, the Bible says, and I actually quoted this verse of scripture, that I'll receive the greater condemnation or judgment I believe in the judgment seat of Christ in regards to this particular topic because I, uh, as your pastor, as your spiritual guide in this local church, I said, I encouraged you in this direction as well. And I said, so I want you to know as well that since I've changed uh, the position here that when I'm preaching the Word of God and this topic comes up, I'm going to have to uh, tell the folks uh, what I believe the Bible really does teach in regards uh, to that subject matter. But I'm not just up there trying to browbeat you. I'm not using the pulpit as a whipping post. But you just need to understand that uh, I, I must preach the Word of God as God reveals it to me. And yet I believe very much the truth of this scripture that I, uh, as a leader uh, in a church when I preach something that I will be called into greater judgment before God than uh, others that aren't in that kind of a position. And it says, for in many, verse 2 again, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, 
that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and it is set on fire of hell. It would do us good in light of talking about the tongue if we would spend some time meditating just on this chapter and looking at and seeing these word pictures that the Holy Spirit is trying to reveal to us to drive this particular truth home. I remember when I was uh, living in Augusta, Georgia, uh, we went out to the woods. We had some uh, clay pits back behind our house as well as some woods. Some pine needles had really fallen from the pine trees and made a nice uh, carpet almost like effect uh, on the uh, floor there on the ground. And I can remember a friend of mine, he took a box of matches and he had those little wood matches and you know if you flick them like that they would light and you know it was real neat to see them fly through the air and you know, and uh, my friend and I, Jimmy, we would run around as this guy would uh, flip the matches and we would, we would try to put that fire out. And we would be, you know, putting this one out and he'd already flicked one over here and put this one out. Before long, the whole woods was on fire, the fire department was there, our parents were there, and we were in trouble. Uh, oh, how great a matter, a little fire kindleth. And uh, so it says here in verse 7, for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs? So can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man and a dude with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. Many times the way we use our tongue is really an outward expression of our heart. And that's what the Bible's trying to bear out to us. So if you have a critical spirit and you are uh, filled with envy and so on, it's going to evidence itself in the way you talk and the accusations and the comments you make. And it says here, this wisdom, verse 15, descendeth not from above, but it's earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. And so this verse that we're talking about tonight, where it says, accuse not a servant unto his master, lest he curse thee and thou be found guilty. And we're not talking about known sin. We're talking about the insinuations that people make, the evil surmisings that people do, and the, uh, the actual accusing of those. And it says, speaks of accusing one without the facts or conclusive proof. Second paragraph in Bible times, the slave or servant had no rights. An individual was not to take advantage of someone less fortunate than themselves. Many slaves were cruelly oppressed, and the Lord encouraged people to treat them kindly. Of course, we have the book Philemon there uh, in the New Testament that attests to this. He says, um, uh, they were not to join into the grief and oppression against a slave. Now, if a false accusation, next paragraph is made, you may be found a liar and your credibility and respect will be eroded. You will bear the guilt of sin and not the accused. And here we find a little bit more of a definition here. Uh, accuse, the one you'll fill in the blank there, accuse means to slander. Slander is a false tale or report maliciously uttered. And that, that word maliciously is there on purpose in the definition. Because many times when something is uttered, there is a, a malignant, a cancerous type of a motive behind that. It's to really try to uh, lessen the value, the reputation of the one, 
And sometimes it's so that you can bring that individual down and you left, try to lift your credibility up. Slander is a false tale or report maliciously uttered and tending to injure the reputation of another by lessening him in the esteem of his fellow citizens, by exposing him to impeachment and punishment, or by impairing his means of living. It means defamation. And slanderer is a defamer, one who injures another by maliciously reporting something to his prejudice. Now we're going to get into some of the practical aspects of slander. And of course, the title of the message here is Do Not Slander. And we have within each and every one of us the ability to do this. And yet we have to be under the control of the Holy Spirit so that we don't do this. And number one, we need to remember the law of sowing and reaping. The law of sowing and reaping. In Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and following, here's what the Bible says. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now bear in mind, uh, the book of Galatians was written to uh, several churches in the province of Galatia. And so he's, it's interesting how he's closing out this book and the admonitions that Paul has given to these churches. He says, For he that soweth to his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall the Spirit reap life everlasting. And in your King James Bible, you notice that that is capitalized. So it's talking about the Holy Spirit of God. He says, And let us not be weary in well doing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. If we don't quit, if we don't stop, if we don't give up, as we have therefore opportunity. Let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. In other words, it's great to do good to all across the board, in the neighborhood, in the community, you know, in the nation and so on. But we ought to pay special attention to care for those in our local New Testament churches that make up this local body of believers. If there's someone in need, we ought to help meet that need. And no one of us can meet the needs of every single one of us. It has to be all of us working in concert together, looking out one with another, as the Bible talks about here in that verse of Scripture, verse 10, the household of faith. And then in Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, Jesus says this right in the Sermon on the Mount. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You remember, as uh, we said on Sunday, or last Wednesday, the, all the commandments have really been boiled down to two. Love the Lord thy God, and then also love thy neighbor as thyself. And so remember the law of sowing and reaping, and we have an example given to us here in uh, uh, Joseph and Potiphar's, the example I brought out, the law of sowing and reaping. And you have Joseph and you have Potiphar, and how that Potiphar's wife made the uh, accusation against him. And then we find the tables turned later on there uh, as uh, Joseph is elevated to number two in the kingdom. But Potiphar's wife lied with the intent to maliciously impunge the, the reputation um, of Joseph. And so uh, we need to remember the law of sowing and reaping. I always say that if you're going to go through trouble... Make sure it's because it's something that God is allowing to come into your life, that there's maybe a trial that he's seeking to strengthen you in, but at the same time, you don't want it to be because you're going through a valley experience because that you sowed the crop and you're just getting your just desserts. Number two, not only about the law of sowing and reaping, remember the faults that you have. When you think about what you're gonna say about someone and the charges you're gonna make, and how you're going to slander them and talk against them, then you need to remember the faults that you have. If you take your Bibles and go to um, uh, Matthew chapter 7, we're going to go there, uh, Matthew chapter 7. I want to begin reading here in uh, verse 3, Matthew 7. Once again, we made reference just a moment ago to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is uh, preaching chapters 5, 6, and 7, referred to as the Sermon on the Mount. We need to remember that 
Everyone has faults. Every single one of us, all of us are sinners. <laughs> and so uh, it says these words in um, verse three. He says, and why, let's start with verse one. Uh, judge not that ye be not judged. This is probably one of the most misunderstood uh, passages of scripture and pulled out of context uh, in, in the New Testament, especially amongst believers. Uh, how many times when you are trying to help someone who may be in sin and you're trying to uh, help get them out of them or restore them or whatever, people say, well, you, you should not judge me. And uh, they get all uptight about that and they quote this verse. The Bible says, judge not that you be not judged. And so uh, it says here, for with what judgment, verse 2, uh, ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but considerest not the beam that is in thine own eye? It's almost like you've got, you know, a piece of uh, eyelash in your eye and it's uh, hindering you. And so uh, uh, you, that's what your neighbor has and you have a big old log in there. And it says here, and why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye and considerest not the beam that is in your eye? So you're, you're so concerned about your neighbor and pointing out his faults that you're not even considering the, the big problems that you have. And it says here, or how wilt thou say to thy brother, verse four, let me pull out the mote out of thine eye and behold a beam is in thine own eye. Thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye and then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. And so there's, I believe that this passage of scripture deals a lot with the motive behind the judgment. I can't, I can't judge your motive, but I can judge your actions. And you know, when you start talking about Bible truth and you look at a particular passage of scripture, first and foremost, when you look at that passage, you have to look at its context. And it doesn't mean because the context says that that particular truth means something there, that it is a complete exposure or exposing of that truth. There are other passages of scripture that may address the same topic, but from a different perspective, a different light, dependent on what the writer, the penman, in the case of the Bible, the Lord is trying to get across. For example, some people try to pit Paul against James in regards to salvation. James emphasizes living out your faith, your professed faith, whereas of course, Paul is addressing the fact that it doesn't have to do with works at all, your salvation. And so they try to pit those two together, almost like they're preaching a separate gospel. But you have to understand where the penmen are coming from in light of that, and you get a clearer understanding. And it's the same thing here. Here Jesus saying, don't, you can't judge somebody's motives because you do that, the law of sowing and reaping, don't be surprised if people turn that on you. And then let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And uh, this shows, I'm just giving you an illustration of what I'm saying here uh, this evening. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, it is reported, this, I'm going to just jump right into it here in verse 1. It is reported commonly that there's fornication among you, and such fornication is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So he's talking about a sin that's taking place in the church, amongst the church membership, and, and that's something that's observable, something that you can see, okay? It says in, in uh, verse two, and ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. Look at verse three. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed. So this wasn't a surmising. This wasn't given by malicious intent. This was given to try to encourage this church that was off base, really reeling in the subject matter of pride and thinking, oh, we're so open-minded that we would allow anybody to come into the church and behave any way they want to, exhibiting the grace of God. And so Paul is addressing and says, no, this is not the right behavior. You are to be holy. 
And so he is pointing out the error of this kind of philosophy and this lifestyle, and also the way the church is handling that. And then he says in verse four, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together in my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Your glory is not good. If you'll drop down a little bit so I don't get um, <laughs> sidetracked with all the subject matter here and just sticking with the whole aspect of judgment here. Notice in verse nine, I wrote unto you in the epistle, that's a letter, not to accompany with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator or covetous or an idolater or a railer or a drunkard or extortioner, with such a one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within? He said, here we are dealing with the unsaved, as he mentions here, in, uh, there in verse uh, 10. But then he says, do not ye judge them that are within? And that's where he talks about here in verse 11. And he says, there's a judgment, there's a proper and right judgment that we as believers and as a local church, we are to be involved in. I may not know why someone has committed the sin that they've committed, but yet because the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, Galatians chapter five, I can identify the sin. I'm not attacking the sinner, I'm attacking, attacking the sin. And so because sinners sin, we must deal with the sinner. And we have to judge that, so we judge the sin. And by virtue of that, if they fail to repent of that, then we have to actually, uh, church, as we would say today, uh, church discipline them. For what have I to do to judge them that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth the unsaved. He says, put away, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So it's important for us to understand this uh, differentiation of uh, what he means by judge not that ye be not judged. It's one thing to judge a person's motive, it's another thing to judge their uh, actions. And so you've got to remember in this whole matter of the way you use your tongue, and once again, I'm not, I'm not preaching this to have us compare this to someone else, but to gauge our own spirituality, our own lives, uh, and remember the faults that you have. I have to remember the faults that I have. And so number three, check your motive before you make your comments regarding another. Check your motive before you make your comments regarding another. Let's take our Bibles and go now to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, uh, chapter, uh, sorry, I went the wrong way, um, chapter eight, Gospel of John, chapter eight, and we'll begin here in verse three. And the elders, this is the Gospel of John, chapter eight, we'll begin in verse three. And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery, and when they had set her in the midst, they said, say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned, but what sayest thou? So you know, they were right in the letter of the law, but yet they had some malicious intent here, of course. And it says here, this they said, tempting him, verse six, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, he that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. Now, it's interesting, there's been a whole lot of surmising going on as to what he must have written on the ground. Uh, they, some people think that he started listing their names and under the names he started listing the sins that they themselves were guilty of. That's all conjecture. But it says here, and again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even to the last, and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. 
When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are thine those, those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And so here we see about the motive behind the exposing of the sin. And you know, God has a plan of dealing with those who are in sin, doesn't he? We see Matthew chapter 18, verses 15, 16, and 17. You have that whole passage that tells you how to uh, confront someone. If a pastor is wrong, you have, you have a way that you go about that as well. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, those last few verses of Scripture lays out the proper way to approach a, a, a spiritual leader in the local church. And the problem arises is even if somebody's try, you know, approaching for, uh, because of some sin, they do it the wrong way and they stand condemned as well. So it's so important for us to look to the Word of God as we say is our sole rule for faith and for practice. Because we, when Christians are involved, it's not to be in retribution, it's not to try to make our point, it's not to build a name for ourselves or elevate ourselves, it's to correct improper behavior. It's to restore that brother. We ought to be seeking to help someone to edify them, not tear them down, and not try to undermine them in the minds and hearts of other believers around. And so, it goes on number four, we should speak evil needlessly of no individual. We should speak evil needlessly of no individual. In Titus chapter 3 and verse 2, it's interesting, that's a leadership book, those three chapters. And here is Paul talking to Titus, and he's saying, look, I've got to leave the Isle of Crete. I, you know, and he's a master church planter to be sure, but there were some things that he left undone in the local church. And there were some things that he wished he had time to set in order, but God was leading him on. And so he says, look, Titus, I want you to stay here. I want you to ordain elders in the various churches on this island. And I want you to set some things in place that I haven't been able to. The things that are lacking, the things that are wanting, the scripture says. And so he says in verse, uh, uh, verse 2 here, he says, to speak evil of no man. In other words, the preacher... Uh, Titus, in this case, is to actually encourage the people in regards to their authorities and said to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers, but gentle, showing all meekness unto all men. And so we're not to speak evil one of another, as well as our authority. Okay, and so it says in, in number five in your study sheet, others have suffered wrongfully at another's words. Others have suffered wrongfully at another's words. And this is probably the greatest hindrance of loose tongues that I can see. It's, not, it's bad for those who are uttering their vileness and their disobedience in, in verbiage, but also those that get caught up in the swell of that, those that get caught up in the, the overhearing of the, uh, the criticisms and things that are made and the slanders uh, that, are, that are said. And so others have suffered wrongfully at another's words. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter 22. And I want us to see how the fallout is great in these types of matters. And that ought to be a concern for us. In 1 Samuel uh, chapter 22, I'll begin reading here in verse 9. It says, Then answered Doeg the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul, and said, I saw the son of Jesse. Now, of course, you know that Saul has had the kingdom stripped from him earlier in this book around chapter 15. And so Saul knows that his time is limited as the king. David's been anointed as the king. And so uh, yet he's not really been brought to the prominence and Saul's not been completely taken out of the way. And so David at this particular uh, juncture is running for his life. And Doeg the Edomite, which was set over the servants of Saul, said, I saw the son of Jesse come into Nob to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. And he inquired of the Lord for him and gave him victuals and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Then the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitub and all his father's house. 
the priests that were in Nob, and they came, all of them to the king. And Saul said, Hear now, thou son of Ahitub. And he answered, Here I am, my lord. And Saul said unto him, Why have ye conspired against me? Thou and the son of Jesse, in that thou hast given him bread and a sword, and hast inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait at the, as at this day. Now what has taken place here is, you know, David comes up, he doesn't have a sword, he's running for his life, but this uh, priest, Ahimelech, is not uh, completely aware of what's going on. And so the Doeg comes in because he is slandering Ahimelech and some of the others, and we see the devastation in just a moment that takes place because of the slander of Doeg. And he says here in verse 14, then Ahimelech answered the king and said, And who is so faithful among all thy servants as David, which is the king's son-in-law? And goeth at thy bidding, and is honorable in thine house. And so he was just saying what he knew. And he says, Did I then, uh, did I then begin to inquire of God for him? Be, be it far from me. You know, David asked me. I gave to him because, look, he's your son-in-law, and he's been so loyal to you, and so on. And, uh, and, and so then Doeg has undermined him. And that's one of the uh, most awful things that someone can do to another is undermine them. And we see what's taking place here. Did I then, verse 15, then begin to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. Let not the king impute anything unto his servant, nor to all the house of my father. For thy servant knew nothing of all this, less or more. And the king said, Thou shalt surely die, Ahimelech, thou and all thy father's house. And the king said unto the footmen that stood about him, Turn and slay the priests of the Lord, because their hand also was with David, and because they knew when he fled, and did not show it to me. But the servants of the king would not put forth their hand to fall on the priest of the Lord. And the king said to Doeg, that traitor, I just added that, uh, Turn thou, and fall upon the priest, and Doeg the Edomite turned, and he fell upon the priest, and slew on that day four score and five persons, eighty-five people that did wear a linen ephod. And Nob, the city of the priests, smote he with the edge of the sword both men and women, children and sucklings, and oxen, and asses, and sheep, and the edge of, with the edge of the sword. And one of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. And Abiathar uh, showed David that Saul had slain the Lord's priest. And David said unto Abiathar, I knew it that day when Doeg the Edomite was there that he would surely tell Saul, I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. Abide thou with me. He says, Fear not, for he that seeketh my life seeketh thy life. But with me thou shalt be in safeguard. And so we see here that others have suffered wrongfully because many times they have listened to someone else's words as they've uttered slander. And they don't know the facts, but they're just going by what they've heard. And what was one of Satan's primary tools there in Genesis chapter 3? Just trying to question God. Just trying to question. Oh, yea, hath God said, causing that doubt. And many times that's the way the devil begins to work in churches and families and uh, even you can probably be recounted in the workplace. We're just causing you to doubt about someone's veracity, someone's truthfulness. And then that seed begins to get sown and then they take up your offense. And many times I've seen it happen in ministry where two people are at odds. They get the ma main matter straightened out amongst themselves. But those in the peripheral have already taken up the offense and they don't know about all the healing that's taken place and yet they're still fighting the battle that's already been resolved. It's a dangerous thing. It's devilish. Very devilish. And it infiltrates and dirties up the church of Jesus Christ. And we see, uh, we have several examples here as well. We have Jesus and Pilate. It's interesting here. Let's go to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27, verses, verse 15 and following. Now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. 
And they had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Of course, you know here, this is where uh, Jesus is before Pilate. He says, therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. You see, here you already see the, the tentacles of this, uh, the, the wrong accusations, the effect of the wrong accusations that have fi begin to filter out because of the lies that were told even about our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says these words, he says in verse 20, not, he says, um, but the chief priests and elders, verse 20, persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. So he said, here's a few priests spreading their venom and yet it incites the people. Uh, Brother Helm and I could tell you some stories about in the prison system where you take a couple of loudmouth inmates spewing their stuff and it can get a whole cell house, you know, just raging mad to where they'll burn whatever they could burn and do whatever they wanted to do. It was unreal. I can remember confronting an inmate in E. Dorm and I was, I was talking to him and I was, we were in the midst of a conversation and I was uh, trying to talk him down. And then I had some other inmates just yapping at him. You're going to let that officer talk to you that way? You're going to do this? You're going to? And, just had, and then he was put in a position where, boy, in front of all these inmates, he was either going to make himself to be uh, you know, a fool by stepping back and just not proceeding with the problem, or he was going to have to get into a fight. And what was happening is people were just working that situation up. And that happens, I know that's an extreme example, but at the same time, we do that on much lesser scale many times if we're not careful and we don't realize the effect that it has on the whole. And so here we find the same thing happening here. Here Pilate's dealing with Jesus and yet the crowd is being worked up. And it says these words, he says in, in um, Verse 21, he says, The governor answered and said unto him, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. It wasn't all. Some were just watching there for a while. But now they got all worked up. And that's what happens when we don't use our mouths right. And it says here, And the governor said, Why, what evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, saying, let him be crucified. They didn't even answer the question. It says, when Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I'm innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and on our children. My, my. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Oh my, I've looked at that verse of scripture many times and I thought, oh Pilate, he already knew that Jesus was innocent. He declared him to be so right there. He says, I'm innocent of the blood. He said, I, of course he wasn't, but he says, hey, I don't find any fault in him. And yet then he has the nerve to scourge Jesus. That word scourge means to torture. He tortured Jesus before he turned him over to the Jews to be crucified. But you see how others have suffered wrongfully at another's words. And so the comfort we have as believers, I find, in 2 Timothy in chapter 4. As uh, Paul's nearing the end of his life, he says these words. He says, Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works. There you see the forgiving spirit of Paul. Of whom be thou where also. He still gives out the warning. Watch out for this guy. For he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer, no man stood with me. All men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. That by me the preaching might be fully known. 
and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. I love verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. You'll never go wrong going by the scriptures. Amen. And so lastly, number six, uh, remember those faults and sins that, that others and God have not seen fit to expose. Should this not make us want to cover the faults of our offending brother? In other words, deal with them one on one. It says, uh, where of course the honor of God did not forbid concealment. You know, just because you know something about someone doesn't mean that you have to spout it off. I'm so glad Jesus doesn't do that. You confess your sin to him, he sends it away. He's not going to bring it up and he's not telling other people about it either. Something's cared for, keep your mouth shut. And just because you know something, you don't have the right or the biblical mandate to go and tell other people about it. And so we find here two uh, verses of scripture and we're done for this evening. It says here in Ephesians chapter 4, it's interesting that both of the passages I close out the lesson with, with Ephesians and Colossians, Ephesians and Colossians deals with the same thing. And Ephesians talks about our position in Christ and Colossians talks about the preeminence of Christ. And it says in Ephesians chapter 4, in verse 31 and 32, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. And then Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 and 13 says, put on therefore as the elect of God. Are you saved tonight? Then put this on, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And all God's people said, Amen. Let's all stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, please.